God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May his love be upon your heart now and forevermore. Amen. The Empire State Building is a beautiful building. At night, it lights up all of New York, quite literally. It is one of the brightest things to see in New York City on any given night. Well, this past Wednesday, the Empire State Building was darkened as a symbolic act to grieve the victims of the Florida shooting. Of course, they had an agenda to motivate people to ban guns. But nonetheless, their act was kind of fitting, for it was a dark day a week ago when Nicholas Cruz shot 17 people, including 14 kids, at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. And since that dark day, people have been screaming in their heads. Things like, we need a change, and let's end the darkness. And some have argued, well, we need a change, and so ban the guns. That will end the darkness. While others have screamed, we need a change, don't let the guns be banned, because guns don't kill people, people kill people. Let's just take common sense steps, to prevent future incidents. And while these two sides don't agree on how to end the darkness, they both agree that something should be done to end the darkness, that we need a change. Well, keep that example in your mind as we see a need for a change at the end of darkness in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter Nine, God summons six angels to execute judgment against the darkness, that is, against the wicked people in the land of Jerusalem. But before they were to make war against the wicked, they were to mark the righteous ones on the forehead so that those righteous ones would be spared. Now, in the the chapter before, Ezekiel had been shown some of the dark deeds of the wicked people in Jerusalem, that they were bowing down to their pagan gods, even praying to the sun god, that they were killing innocent people for their gain, that they would get rich off of them, and that they were abusing the poor. And so is dark in Jerusalem. Ironically, these dark characters thought that they were in the light because they would were spared of the first exile that happened in 605 B.C. This was about seven to eight years later in 597 B.C. And so they privately thought God has executed judgments against those guys, against those worthless losers. But we obviously have been spared, and so we obviously have the favor of Yahweh, our God, and all of the gods that are out there. And we are in the light, they are obviously in the darkness. Well, this is why God was bringing a dark day to them, bringing his judgment against them, to judge them, to put many of them to death. Now Ezekiel saw the judgment that God was about to give against them, and Ezekiel had compassion in his heart. And on two different occasions, he said, Alas! Lord Yahweh, you are going to destroy, I mean, are you going to destroy the whole remnant of Israel? To which Yahweh offered the hope that he was spiritually among the remnants already, already, especially in Babylon. And he was a sanctuary for them there just by having his presence there. And that there was hope, hope for the future because He would gather his people from the nations where he scattered them and bring them back to Israel. And it would be totally, totally renewed. The darkness would be out of God's temple, and that was important. Yahweh said, I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them, and I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will be careful to keep my laws. They will be 
my people, and I will be their God. That's chapter 11. Actually reappears later in chapter 38. So how do we get a change? A change in people's hearts. How is the darkness finally eliminated? Well, before we get to even answer that question, we have to ask a more basic question, and that is, how does one even recognize the darkness? How do you recognize the darkness? Because you see, one of our big problems as sinful creatures is that we don't even recognize the darkness. We don't acknowledge the darkness. We avoid the darkness. Or we see the darkness and think it's just fine, it's great, and we'll just live there. Well, a prime example of not acknowledging the darkness are atheists. Atheists don't recognize the light or the darkness. And for them, what would be moving more toward the light, or what they call progress, is man's willpower. They often disguise that in the word evolution, but that's what they kind of mean, man's willpower. Man's willpower to make smart decisions. Man's willpower to control the rules and keep people safe. Man's willpower and intellect to make inventions and offer solutions. And in theory, true earthly peace is achievable in the eyes of many atheists in the Darwinian right. A world without violence or hunger is achievable in their eyes. A world where we could live a lot longer, perhaps one day even for forever, is achievable in their eyes, as if we could achieve heaven by itself in this life, which of course we can't. But to many atheists, it just takes enough study, enough science, enough know-how and ingenuity to get it all done. And as for darkness, darkness to an atheist is just anything that is painted negative, anything that is painful, anything that causes somebody some discomfort. Death? Yeah, definitely, sure, because nobody likes death, but darkness to an atheist is actually kind of vague. It is ambiguous, though scientifically they think it's verifiable, but it's vague. It is ambiguous how some people in the world can go crazy or even overly angry. Darkness is general. Well, in America, most Americans are still largely Christian. 70% 70, 70 still identify as Christian in some way. Only 3% identify as atheist. Only 4% identify as agnostic. But somehow, those atheistic ideas have seeped right into many people's thoughts that mankind has the power has the power and the know-how to progress the world into some great utopia all by themselves. That the darkness out there is bad and painful, but it's kind of vague also, and they've got the power over it. It's more important that they have the power over it, and let's focus on man-made solutions. And that puts many of us in danger in a greater danger of going down a more treacherous road, a road called nihilism. And what is nihilism? Nihilism is the basic belief that there is no meaning to life at all, no real principle to live by. We're just making it up as we go. And while many profess to believe in God, many are living more by atheistic and nihilistic ideals. Well, in contrast, what does God teach? What does Moses teach in the Old Testament, and what does scriptures teach? Well, they teach us that the darkness is a consequence of our sins, that our offenses against God have made the darkness come into the world. Darkness was always possible. That's why God said, don't eat the fruit, but we ate it, and now we are dealing with the pain and the sorrow and the death that it all came with. That's why God said, don't eat the fruit. Because if you do, you are going to cry. 
and you are going to be in pain and have to do labor and be sick, and yes, you will one day die. The earth is under a curse because of us. And we have to accept these terms because we are responsible for them. Accept the reality because that's how it is now. Do you realize that we are the only religion that teaches this? We're the only religion that actually believes this. Buddhists and Hindus believe we are just disillusioned, that we are just misdirected, and we are trying to escape this reality. And both Islam and Judaism largely believe that we are born into this world pure. It's just when you grow up, that's when you start to sin. But we, as Christians, we believe we are born into a corrupted world. When a child is born, we say, yeah, wow, that is great, that is beautiful. But we also know that it is fraught with a lot of problems, especially with the problem of original sin and rebellion and death. You see, we need to acknowledge and accept the tragedy of sin and all of its consequences. And we need to teach that to our children at a very young age because it is fundamental to who we are now. This is so important, it might be only second to the teaching of Jesus Christ himself, our Savior. And either way, it's necessary because you don't understand who your Savior is unless you understand the terrible catastrophe that we are in. And what happens? What happens when we don't teach this? Well, what happens is people stop recognizing what the darkness is. And they start making their own moral decisions based upon their own experiences. And it creates a indulgent mentality in a society. It creates chaos and disorder, becoming just messed up. Because unintentionally, people are letting the disease rule them by ignoring it. And so instead, we should teach that we are born sinful and messed up, and we live in a cursed earth, imperfect world. And now we have to carry it. We have to bear it as we bear the weight of our own sins. When we commit those sins, we carry them to the cross. We don't carry them in a salvation sense, but we live out the pain of them, don't we? We must bear it. And so we must acknowledge the darkness. Well, then back to the question, how do we get to a change? How does darkness become light? Well, just like we said last week, we see, as we see in all of the Bible, that God acts first. In our text today, God marked the righteous to spare them. He chose them, and he marked them, and he spared them. And God's Spirit was with them. He was with the remnant, and so he was a sanctuary to them. And God made a promise, and he made a plan to correct the larger problem that we ourselves made. He is correcting the problem that's not even his fault. And in Ezekiel chapter 11, God speaks of that as changing people's hearts, removing their cold stone hearts and replacing them with warm, well-functioning hearts of flesh. Well, how does that work? Well, we, we know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works on us. That is why we are baptized in water and fire, in baptism, for he calls, gathers, strengthens, enlightens us through word and sacrament. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins and makes us new people. The Holy Spirit helps us to believe. It creates faith, and he helps us to understand God's words. And this is all worked through Jesus. All worked through Jesus. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. 
Because just as Jesus died but was made alive, so too, even though we are dead, now we are made alive. Even though we are under a curse, Jesus lifted that curse by becoming the curse for us. Even though we were born sinful and are sinful and so do deserve God's wrath, we are spared because of Jesus' sacrifice. We are forgiven. Jesus took God's wrath. He bared it on himself, and he gave us his own righteousness in its place. And so we are reborn in Jesus. Well, that's how it works. How long does it take? Well, first, how long do we expect it to take? Well, quite often we want it to be instant because we have instant food and we can just pop food in the microwave or we can just find answers on the internet, but it doesn't quite often work that way, does it? Well, there are a few angles to look at this. First, Jesus is the light. He's the light of the world. He has pierced the darkness, and it took him just over 4,000 years to appear in the flesh without his glory. And it's just been over 6,000 years since the fall of Adam and Eve, since that problem of darkness. So this plan has taken a long time in the big picture. But then personally, some things do take less time, like conversion. Saul, he persecuted Christians, but in one day, he became a believer. But thereafter, he had a whole lifetime of growth and spiritual growth. In one day, the woman at the well was so inspired by Jesus that she told all of her friends. But I'm sure thereafter, it was a lifetime of practice and patience. Well, in our Old Testament text for the Israelites in Ezekiel, it was about three and a half generations. That is 70 years. In 586 BC, God totally wiped out Jerusalem, destroyed the temple and most of the people that were there. But by 536 BC, 50 years later, people began to return to Jerusalem and they began to rebuild the temple. And then finally in 516 BC, the temple was totally rebuilt and the people's hearts were finally ready. For they were humbled in those three and a half generations and they learned to rely on their God. And it would be a prime time to read and hear God's word more fervently. So how long does a change like that happen? Well, with concern to God's presence in your life, instantaneously. God is always there with you. But with concern to the progress of your well-being and the full defeat of darkness, who knows? In God's good time whatever that is. But God is there. God is there to carry us from step to step, even though we are still bearing the consequences of original sin and our actual sins. That is carrying them straight to the cross. It takes some time. Well, how can we apply this to our personal lives? Well, let's go back to our original Illustration, the New York City darkened the Empire State Building in commemoration for those dead victims in Florida. Well, you and I are kind of like a dark building without Jesus because we've messed up uh, in our relationships and we have made some bad decisions and we have bad attitudes and we get angry and we get depressed and we form bad habits, and we lose sight of who God is in our lives. And many times, like those who ignore, ignore the darkness, we too ignore the darkness because we don't want to admit it or see it or acknowledge it in our sinful lives. And so we need to admit that our relationships do need repairing and that our personalities needed, need to be humbled and that our tongues need to be tamed, that our practices need training by God to be more obedient. We need to admit it, and we need to take it straight to 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then what? Well, then step by step, little by little, Jesus makes us new. God carries us right through that journey. But once we have Jesus throughout that whole journey, once we have Jesus, we are no longer dark buildings, but rather we are bright, brilliant buildings because Jesus is glowing in them. His light shines bright in us the whole time, as long as we have Jesus. And when we reject him, it is as if that light flickers and dims and goes out a little. But when we don't reject him or don't rebel against him, his light shines bright, blazingly bright. There's nothing to compare it to. The darkness is real. Yes, it is. And we have to come to terms with that, accept that. But Jesus and his salvation is real too. That gives us hope. And he is the only thing that really dispels the darkness. Nothing else will do. And Jesus, he's passionate about it. His shining ability outweighs our ability to be dark. For he goes searching for us, and he keeps igniting the fire when we are trying to put it out. Jesus doesn't desire us to remain in the darkness, though some will choose to remain there. No, Jesus desires his light to shine in everyone, if possible. Jesus shines and is something that is more than symbolic. It is real. It is a changing thing, a real life changing thing. Let us let that light shine in our lives. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep and guard us in Christ Jesus. Amen.